It is a surprisingly common thing to find unassuming and commonplace forms of life that become quite unusual upon a closer look. There are few examples of this that are more striking than the barnacles. These distinctive forms of life are generally quite easily recognized, yet most people don't seem to know what they actually are. With a bit of investigation, one finds a unique group of invertebrates that undergo a baffling metamorphosis. They are also forms of life with some very odd habits. Among the barnacles, we can find species with unexpected variations on their standard patterns. Within the most extreme of these variations, we may even find the stuff of nightmares. Barnacles are familiar forms of life for anybody who spends time at the seashore. They tend to be quite abundant on rocky beaches as they need something solid to affix themselves to. Even the sandier shores may have their share, living on the pilings beneath piers and any other suitable surfaces that might be available. These sedentary forms of life are small and fairly easy to overlook, at least unless one has had the misfortune of brushing up against them. Many species tend to have a number of sharp edges, and it is not at all uncommon to see minor cuts and scrapes as a result of unwary contact. There is a certain sense to this, as many sorts of barnacles are remarkably well-armored creatures. At low tide, their distinctive forms stand out like miniature fortresses sealed away from the open air. Since they cannot move as adults, their armor is a necessity for survival. Without the weight constraints of locomotion, they can afford to grow quite heavy exoskeletons, sufficient to protect them from all but the most persistent of predators. Of course, as the barnacles are quite thoroughly immobile, one might well wonder just how they could have arrived at whatever surface they are adhering to. The answer is straightforward enough. While the adult forms are indeed quite immobile, the larval forms are capable swimmers. These microscopic creatures drift to some extent within the plankton, but they seek out suitable habitats as they begin to approach maturity. While there are a number of variations among the different species of barnacles, the most common pattern is roughly as follows. A typical barnacle begins its life as a nauplius larva. The nauplius is a larval form found in many crustacean groups, but not all. I should take a moment to mention that barnacles are an example of very highly modified crustaceans. Yes, these little creatures are cousins to crabs and lobsters and other such decapods. In fact, there is a baffling variety among the different crustacean groups, but for now, the barnacles alone are more than enough to consider. Returning to the Nauplius, it is a swimming planktonic creature with a vaguely segmented body and several appendages. In terms of developmental patterns, it is, in effect, a swimming head. With each molt, the larval form gains additional body segments at the back. This posterior growth, along with some incremental modification, eventually results in whatever the adult body form might be for the creature. The segments that made up the initial nauplius are eventually repurposed into the head, and the swimming appendages are modified into things like antennae and mouthparts. As an interesting bit of trivia, a barnacle nauplius can be distinguished from other varieties by the presence of two horns on the body. Most, if not all, barnacles with this larval stage just happen to have this particular feature. Still, this nauplius is only the first stage of barnacle development. In typical barnacles, the next larval stage is the cyprid. This creature is still capable of swimming, though it has been modified to have a distinctive oval shell covering most of the body. There are antennules, which are used to detect suitable sites to quite literally settle down. It is believed that barnacles select their eventual irrevocable homes by chemical cues, often including the presence of other barnacles. This makes a degree of sense, as the presence of living barnacles nearby would suggest a suitable environment. There is another reason for this, however, which I will address in a little while. First, let us finish the life cycle. When the cyprid finds a good place to settle, it effectively glues its head to whatever the chosen surface might be. Subsequent molts see the body greatly modified through juvenile stages and into the adult form. 
In a typical acorn barnacle, the end result of this is a creature encased in armor, incorporating a series of closable plates, sometimes known as turga and scutes. The surrounding fixed armor is made up of a series of more or less fused plates. These include lateral plates, the carina, and the rostrum. Within this fortress of personal armor, there is a fairly simple digestive system and a series of feeding appendages known as cirri. Underwater, these can be extended when the scutes and turga are moved aside to open the barnacle's aperture. They rake through the water, capturing any small particles and bringing them inside for consumption. The cirri are modified legs, and they are the basis of the scientific name of the barnacles, the subclass Cirripedia. The word cirrus is Latin for a curl of hair, while the word pedia is Latin for a foot. So, the name roughly means feet, or legs, that resemble a curl of hair. In any case, the most familiar barnacles are likely the acorn barnacles, but another common pattern is the stalked barnacles. Basically, these are barnacles that have an armored body at the end of a flexible, fleshy stalk. Goose barnacles are a good example of this, and there is an odd story behind this odd name. While there are several species of goose barnacles, they all have a similar overall appearance. A body covered in pale, calcareous armor plates, and a relatively dark, often almost black, underlying stalk. This pattern bears an odd and quite coincidental resemblance to a creature known as the barnacle goose, Branta leucopsis. These geese have necks covered in black feathers and a body covered in pale feathers. The wings are also pale and have a degree of patterning somewhat reminiscent of the plates of a gooseneck barnacle. It was once believed, by some at least, that the goose barnacles and the barnacle geese were different life stages of the same creature. Since these geese are migratory, they were not around at certain times of the year. Meanwhile, people would see the beds of little barnacles that looked vaguely, very vaguely, like miniature versions of these geese. In the end, more careful investigations revealed that this was a mistaken notion. Still, this is almost sad in a way. Sometimes the truth is indeed stranger than fiction, but this particular fiction was wonderfully bizarre. That being said, there is plenty of rather disturbing strangeness to be found among the more factual aspects of the barnacles. Most of these sedentary little crustaceans have a rather odd and uncommon feature for marine invertebrates. The vast majority of invertebrates found in the ocean reproduce by scattering eggs and sperm into the seawater, often at specific times of the year to maximize the odds of fertilization. In contrast, barnacles rely upon internal fertilization. This is something of a problem since they are completely immobile as adults. This issue is somewhat mitigated by the fact that barnacles are often hermaphrodites, having both male and female organs. So, if nothing else, a barnacle may often simply fertilize itself. However, this is not generally a good idea in the long run. Inbreeding among animals tends to cause genetic deterioration over several generations, and it is hard to be much more inbred than a creature that has essentially traded gametes with itself. So there is a definite advantage in finding a partner to trade genetic material with. You may recall how I mentioned earlier that many barnacles appear to intentionally settle where other barnacles of their own species are already living. This puts them within reach. As it turns out, the male organ possessed by a barnacle is capable of rather remarkable extension and is equipped with chemosensors that allow it to seek out a suitable neighbor. As barnacles are hermaphrodites, any neighbor that is the same species is a viable option. As odd and potentially disturbing as this might be, it gets even stranger when one considers certain varieties of barnacle and where they live and carry out such curious courtship. As these creatures are filter feeders, they benefit from a steady flow of water over their bodies. On beaches, this water flow is accomplished easily enough between wave action and the regular fluctuations of the tides. In open water, there is another method. Lepus anatifera, also known as the pelagic gooseneck barnacle, preferentially attaches itself to floating objects like driftwood. Still, such inanimate objects don't tend to generate much water flow around themselves. A swimming variety of vertebrate, on the other hand, can generate a fairly consistent current. 
There is an entire family, the Colonobiidae, that attach themselves to sea turtles. Incidentally, this family name contains the word root kalon, which is Greek for turtle. Another family, the Coronulidae, specializes in living on whales. This family name contains a variation of the word root corona, which means a crown. The armor plating of these barnacles does often resemble a small crown in overall shape. In both cases, the cyprids of these groups seek out the scent of their preferred habitats. There is even, apparently, a fair amount of host specificity. A different species of barnacle will seek out different species of turtle or whale, as the case may be. The coronulids in particular burrow into the skin of their whale hosts to avoid being swept off by the relatively rapid flow of water that results from the whale's swimming. Regarding the precise relationship between these swimming animals and their passengers, the details can be variable and a bit murky. So far as turtle barnacles are concerned, it appears that they are, at the very least, an inconvenience. I should note that some people with very good intentions take it upon themselves to try to remove barnacles from these pelagic reptiles. This is helpful, at least in theory. However, such an endeavor must be undertaken with great caution to avoid damaging the underlying skin in the process. As for the whale barnacles, they generally appear to function as commensals. They do not help or harm the whale, but they do benefit from the association themselves. It is possible that some whales might use their resident barnacles as a sort of armor while fighting for potential mates. Here, such barnacles would be mutualists, as they are providing a benefit to their host. On the other hand, if the barnacles create significant drag and make the whale work harder to swim through the water, they would technically be parasites. After all, a parasite benefits from its host while doing harm. While the whale barnacles burrow into their host to a fairly limited extent, there are groups of barnacles that take this quite a bit further. One often overlooked group is the Acrothoracica. These barnacles lack the armor plating of their more common cousins in the group Thoracica. Rather than remaining on a surface, they burrow into whatever surface they settle on as larvae. Thankfully, this surface is generally some variety of calcareous material rather than an animal's hide. Such materials include mollusk shells, coral skeletons, and certain varieties of rock. Of course, it is no easy matter to burrow into what amounts to solid stone, but it is possible with the right equipment. The cypred larvae in this group are equipped with teeth that they use to scrape out a burrow for themselves as they metamorphose. These soft-bodied burrowing barnacles appear to not be hermaphrodites. However, it is not unknown for a small male barnacle to take up a residence in the burrow of a larger female. In some species, this diminutive male may take up a residence within the female herself. This is, of course, rather intimate, but it is nothing compared to the horrifying intimacy of the most nightmarish of the barnacle groups. The Rhizocephala are a group of highly modified barnacles, recognizable as such only by their larval forms and genetic patterns. The name roughly translates into root head, an apt name considering the metamorphosis these creatures undergo. Like some of the other barnacle groups, these larvae seek out a very particular sort of host. It is not a turtle in this case, or a whale. Instead, it is a crab, and an unfortunate crab at that. Now, this should not be confused with other barnacles within the Thoracica that sometimes settle on the outside of crab shells. This is not at all uncommon, and while it might be a minor inconvenience for the crab, these passengers are removed the next time the creature molts. One might even feel a bit sorry for the barnacles left clinging to a rapidly degrading scrap of discarded exoskeleton. With the rhizocephala, it is quite a different story. There are variations in the details, but a typical scenario plays out roughly as follows. When a female larva locates a suitable crab, it affixes itself and metamorphoses into a rather nondescript creature known as a kentragon. This kentragon injects a mass of cells known as a vermigon into the crab. To be clear, the barnacle as such is now inside of the crab's body beneath its outer shell. This is the beginning of the nightmare. 
Rather than forming an armored fortress, or even a soft-bodied creature in a burrow, this cell mass grows into a network of root-like structures that spread throughout the entire body of the crab. These structures derive nutrients directly from the host's hemolymph. They also modify its behavior and produce chemicals that go so far as to feminize male crabs. There is a reason for this drastic modification, but to understand it we must understand something of normal crab anatomy and reproduction. On the underside of a crab, one can see a segmented patch between the legs towards the back. This is the equivalent to a lobster's tail, tucked up beneath the body of the creature. It is not completely fused to the crab's underside, though. In female crabs, it includes what amounts to a brooding chamber. Eggs are kept within this space, attached to a series of small appendages. Considering how aggressive, armored, and generally cantankerous most crabs can be, this is a relatively safe place for the eggs. The parasitic barnacle twists this natural brooding behavior to its own benefit. As it matures, it grows a sack of reproductive tissue among the myriad branches of its otherwise featureless body. This sac protrudes into the brood chamber, and is technically known as the externa. This is in contrast to the rest of the barnacle's body, known as the interna. The crab cares for the parasitic externa much as it might normally care for a clutch of eggs. This is why the male crabs are feminized, so that they will also exhibit these maternal instincts. Of course, there is no room for any actual eggs, or sperm for that matter, so the barnacle also happens to castrate its host. Effectively, the crab has been reduced to something rather like a zombie, simply carrying the barnacle around and obtaining food to fund its growth. When it is mature, the reproductive externa begins to release pheromones. These are sought out by male cypred larvae. When these males find it, they undergo a relatively brief and limited metamorphosis into what is sometimes known as a trichogon. This is the male equivalent of the kentragon, and it is little more than a mass of a few cell types. This enters the externa, and eventually develops into a mass of sperm-producing cells which fertilize the eggs developing within the structure. After this task is done, the externa eventually drops away from its host. The crab molts a little while later, and a new externa develops. Unfortunately, the crab is stuck with this remarkably invasive parasite for the rest of its life. Now, at this point, I could try and suggest a hypothetical equivalent scenario of some sort. Imagine if a human was parasitized in this way, etc. However, for this particular creature, I think the account of the crab is more than sufficient to leave most listeners more than a little disturbed, so I will simply leave it at this. Even the commonplace and familiar barnacles turn out to be remarkably unusual and highly modified creatures. Living fortresses that feed with their legs and live their lives stuck headfirst to their permanent home as they seek out mates with a remarkably extensible organ. The groups that live as passengers are stranger still, hitching a ride on far larger creatures that are perhaps not exactly willing hosts. Strangest of all, and most horrifying by far, are the highly specialized parasites. It is difficult to believe that these living nightmares could be related to creatures that appear to be so innocuous and easily overlooked. Thank you for listening. I hope you have enjoyed this brief glimpse into the more unusual side of the natural world. If you wish to know more, here are a few things that might be worth looking into. If you found this enjoyable, feel free to leave a like. If you think others would enjoy this content, by all means, share. If you have something to say or ask about, honest comments are always welcome. If you wish to see more from this channel, a subscription would be most helpful. Until next time.